This is uh, Tree Safety and Tools. I'm Jim Button. I have been in the campground industry for 37 years. This is Mark and Ben Steffen. They've been in the campground industry for 15 years. A um, few things is we just like you to silence your cell phones uh, during the class so that there's no interruptions. If you need to step outside, that's just fine. Uh, a few other things uh, that I'd like to just uh, talk about is um, if, if you get nothing out of this, take this out. When we talk about safety, we're going to talk about gadgets and things to do and uh, how not to do this. The number one thing is if you don't take care of yourself, maintain yourself and watch yourself and have people watch out for you, then nothing else matters. So always fall back on safety and taking care of yourself, number one, because if you're not here to do any of the work, you know, it's, not, it's irrelevant. So um, with that being said, this is kind of an interacting class. This is only an hour class. Uh, I just want to go around the room, just introduce yourself, say where you're from, and then we'll start the presentation with people that we don't know. Uh, new people that we haven't seen before. So again, uh, welcome to the class, and we'll start out here. I'm Larry from Marlboro. Dave Schneider, can you trust me from? Uh, Regan Meyer, can you trust me from? Well, you're from Apple Creek Campground. Tom from Scenic Ridge Campground. Uh, Brian Peterson from Stony Creek Carver Resort in Oslo. Laura Sue from the Amanda RV Park and Event Center in Oslo, Norway. Jim Bunker from Rich Chandler from Glacier Valley Campground. Nick Gardner from Deer Haven Campground. Mike Lewis from Deer Haven Campground. Bert Davis from Dell's Camping Resort. Richard Rose, Rose Enchanted Forest Campground. Joe from Diamond Lake Campground. Michael Smith from the Castle Mountain Campground. Aaron Lockmiller from uh, Lost Falls Campground. Kevin from Timber Trails, Oklahoma. Brian Handy from Royal Oaks Campground. Mike from Silver Springs. Well, welcome, welcome to everybody, and thank you again. Again, this is interacting. So, if you have a, a better idea, a better suggestion, you know, by all means, you know, just raise your hand and interject. Uh, we're all professionals here in our industry, so um, what uh, his idea might be a lot better than what I do. So, please feel free to interject. So, with that, Ben. Yes. All right. Is this anybody's first Waco convention? All right. We got a couple. So welcome. We hope you uh, find value. Uh, like Jim said, we've been doing this for a while. So uh, hopefully you can learn stuff here. I know it's sure been valuable for us over the years. So uh, it's good from that perspective. So today we're going to talk about uh, mostly uh, safety and then uh, maintenance issues and tools and equipment and whatever else it turns into. Uh, so you are more than welcome, like Jim said, to interject at any point. Uh, what idea I have for my campground may not work best for your campground, and what works best for your campground may not work best for my campground. So we all got different ideas. So to get the conversation started, uh, I'd rather start get everybody talking instead of do death by PowerPoint all morning. So uh, I want to know what is your biggest maintenance challenge? So if we want to go around the room a little bit, if anybody wants to start. Uh, if we know what everybody's biggest challenge is, we certainly can focus in on that area as well. So, does anybody want to start? Got one. Using tools properly and treating them nicely. I think uh, treating tools nicely especially mm -hmm. is a good, good topic because we are always in a hurry. And uh, so you may not do what's best for the tool or even best for yourself on the topic of safety. So uh, that, that's, a good, that's a good one. Anybody else? Yep, so, yeah, so sometimes even just taking the time to think about what you need to complete a job or a task, and so you have it with you instead of making nine trips somewhere. So, there's got to be more. I know people have problems. <laughs> there you go, trimming. <laughs> yeah, roundup, fire. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. 
Does anybody have equipment issues? No? It all runs good? <laughs> <laughs> everything's, brand, really. everything's brand new. Everybody's got brand new equipment. It all runs this great. This time of the year, it runs just fine, right? Yeah. <laughs> everybody knows what type of, uh, I know it sounds simple, but everybody knows what type of gasoline to put in your small engines, correct? Water, right? Yeah, or diesel, like my employees did that one time. Diesel works great. Uh, you know, super unleaded. Everybody knows that? Premium. Yes. Yeah, premium. We need to be careful in regards to that is that some premium fuel has ethanol in it. Okay, sure, it doesn't have ethanol for small engines. Yeah, that is true. You need to watch your gas station. So I know, like, by us, there are one gas station particularly that does have no ethanol, and then some of them have still ethanol in them. So. Yeah, you keep on, if, if you use regular on an ongoing basis, uh, the carburetors are just going to come up and you're going to have problems down the road in always having to take those uh, small engines in. So by all means, you know, use the you know, better gasoline for your small engines. So. Yep. All right, so I think before we dive into equipment maintenance, I think we'll go over some tree safety and chainsaw safety quick. And then um, at that point, we're just kind of going to open it up and see if we can help everybody out and talk amongst everybody and figure, figure out what we can here. So uh, the next topic is tree trimming. So uh, before we start trimming trees, do you maybe want to talk about some chainsaw safety best practices? Chainsaw safety, um, the biggest challenge that I have is if you like storm damage this year, you know, we've had our share of that. And when you get a tree that's twisted, the biggest thing is find out where the stress is coming from. Because, you know, you could break a leg, an arm, you know, get the throw saw thrown at you. A lot of bad things can happen. So biggest thing is, is, you know, what I find with tree trimming is, number one, take your time. Keep thinking. Don't worry about what's going on or I got a problem over here, I got a problem over there. Worry about what's going on right here, what you can control because if you can't control this, like Jim said, if you're not there, you got problems, real problems, not just, you know, the tree's bad. So, um, you know, make sure you undercut things and you're dropping them. Um, you know, use your head and know where the pressure's coming from. Like Mark said, you know, that, that pressure point is, is pretty critical because what you think when, when you're using the chainsaw, if we're all used to just going like this, it might not necessarily be a cut that you do like that. You might have to just score it underneath to take that pressure off and then slowly uh, cut the top. But you've always got to be watching, watching in your peripheral, peripheral, it's early That was morning, big. <laughs> peripheral, to see what's happening. Are other limbs coming down? Is that tree hanging? so that if, when you cut that, it's gonna fall, hit something else, and maybe make a limb or a branch. I find when you're in doubt of something too, you know, if you're just not sure, you're looking at it, you see something's gonna happen, get your pulse out, you know? It keeps you a safe distance from it. So if something happens to your pulse out, it's better than your leg. And make sure you have uh, the proper saw for the job, like he said. You know, you don't wanna have when you're cutting a, a log like this, you don't want a small chainsaw for that. Uh, you want something that you know has some uh, some beef behind it, so uh, that if there is an issue, uh, you have the RPMs, you know, take care of that. But of of course, you know, this is a whole list of everything that we do, right? I mean, we all have face masks and safety glasses. We all put that on every day, right? Right. right? Yeah. yeah, I'm sure. Same with, uh, you know, the saws with the chain guards. Of course, this is, by all means, you, you need to have that on. That, uh, uh, the chain guard and break, I mean, that is crucial. I'm on the fire department. We always have our chainsaws in the locked position, always. So if you aren't in a habit of doing that, get in the habit of having that break guard and engaging it so that when you start it, I've yeah, actually had one kick off on me that didn't have a chain guard on it. Yeah. You know, back, you know, 25 years ago. Yeah. It, it's you not a good thing when you grab your hand like this and you start looking and hoping your finger is still attached and not on your other hand. Everybody knows what the break is on the chainsaw. That mm -hmm. break then okay. And so again, uh, make sure that that's on. If you aren't in the habit of doing that, try and get in the habit of doing that. It's for your safety. 
or whoever's running that chainsaw so it just doesn't start up and take off right away. Um, approved shoes, again, steel toe. Uh, it only takes a split second for something to happen to you. Uh, a pant leg, a arm, a finger, anything to toe, even though they're steel, sho steel toe shoes, you know, again, when you're cutting through, I know it sounds silly, know where your feet are. Sounds silly, but know where your feet are. Uh, have the proper gloves, proper clothing, um, chainsaw chaps, fall protection harness if you're up in a, a high lift. Again, my, for me, I always like to take two people. Always take two people for the what if. So what if something does happen and we don't want that? So always take somebody with you, but that person must know to, to stay away from you so that if you're, you have that chainsaw and you go like this, that they're not there, okay? Um, the, the harness is crucial. Anytime you're up in the air, anytime, we can go around this room and I bet you that we've had an incident, we'll call it an incident, no OSHA people in here, right? We've had an incident of not being tied to something, right? So always, always be tied off. Uh, lift safety, oh, here it is, work with a partner, watch for falling debris. Just because you're cutting over here, cutting over here is no sign that something over here isn't ready to fall down. And extension ladders, they're, again, there could be somebody in this room that maybe had an issue with the safety ladders. I could probably throw a ball to them. Um, but if you take nothing out of this, it takes a split second for something to happen in a chainsaw accident. A split second. That oh. picture in there, that may have happened in our campground, and it wouldn't have been me or him, but there's one other person of my son's that uh, that had happened to. And he was real lucky. He got three scratches on his leg, and that was it. And all he was doing was he was, had his chainsaw in the hand. The chain was a little loose, so it was running. He just got cut, and he stepped over a log, and he picked up, and he grabbed his pant. Yeah. You know, it just, the, it's scary how quick that happens. Yes, sir. One thing about harnesses, um, check it. I don't know if the harnesses have dates on them, but we buy new harnesses. Yeah. Local utilities, they require new harnesses every two years. And some of those guys give us their harnesses, we'll use them for a couple more years. But if you got an old harness, get rid of it. Yeah. We also always use the double harnesses. So when you're switching, you're never unhooked. One of those two cords is always attached. Yeah, and Dave's a great guy for going up in a lift. I've seen him a few times, and, and he runs a lift real well. So if you have any questions on running a lift, Okay, Dave, how many times right have you there. forgot the hook before you went up? Did you have a question? Plenty of time. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, again, you know, um, it's the end of the day. It's 5 o'clock. We're thinking we're going to close down for the end of the day. And, you know, we just want to do a tree or two, maybe a limb or two. And, you know, what you think you're doing up in the lift, uh, I just want to get that pine tree. Yeah, I'm gonna do this. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna take the poles off, right? And then I'm gonna just reach, reach a little bit higher. Accidents do happen. Again, take care of yourself. Yep. Another this topic. Is, oh, this go ahead. Is, if, if you don't like anything <laughs> gruesome, don't look at this. This is a last minute cut. This is a last minute, I'm gonna get that limb. And this is, this is what happens oh, in a split second. I've seen this one. It wasn't mine. <laughs> Just throw a this, disclaimer This specific that instance. One <laughs> that one. <laughs> he's a good friend of mine, and he's in this class right now. And I just wanted to bring awareness of what could happen. What could happen. And the end result is, the hand is, is fine, and um, everything's kind of normal, so to speak. Um, 
But it could turn out a lot worse. It, it could have, it could have, it could have ended up with having a thumb not attached. So, Mr. Davis, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Um, that, that would be <laughs> what you see there. Do you have ten hands or ten fingers? I got ten fingers. Ironically, that's my second chainsaw accident. But it's, uh, you know, accidents do happen. And what actually happened there, I'll elaborate, was I was in a bucket and I've been cutting trees for a long time. And it was the end of the day and I had, it was the last branch on the project. <laughs> And I've, 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 through the years, I've trained myself to use both hands to use my climbing saw to cut trees. And, you know, the rule of thumb is I wanted to grip to oh, wait, place no this intended. branch. No pun intended. <laughs> That's right. No pun intended. So you cut low and you grab high. So I grab high and I cut low. And when I came back up, when I, when I lifted back up, I let off the trigger of the saw, obviously, and it was a dead oak limb, and I like to use nice sharp saws. So as the chain was spooling down, it ran up the limb and into the palm of my hand with the tip of the saw. So the saw was actually spooled down and caused that much damage. Yeah, it's, again, it, it only takes that split second for something to happen, and, and you know, when this happened to Bert, you know, kind of got to my gut a little bit and I was like, you know, you know, I don't know, so we had ever did a safety class, you know, about chainsaws and, and the respect that a chainsaw does need and what we think that we're going to do that last minute cut or, hey, it's a widow maker and I'm just going to underscore it a little bit and, and we think that it's going to drop right here, but it doesn't. Always err on the side of caution. Listen to the voice in the back of your head. If you're doing something, you're thinking, huh, maybe I shouldn't do this. That voice is trying to tell you something. But if are we smart enough to listen, that's the thing, you know? After you do something dumb like that and you thought that, you thought, you know, I thought about that, but you didn't listen to yourself and something bad happened. It's so, I mean, if we're all here to share information and learn each other's mistakes, um, we have an 80 foot telescopic jail that you can lift. <laughs> last 15 years in that thing, we've cut probably 800, 900 trees in the world of those years. And uh, my experience has been a couple times when we're cutting, quite often we have you know, 80 to 100 foot trees where we're cutting 20 feet of tree above your head. We'll cut trees over the top of seasonal campers, I mean directly over the top of the camper. So we can go up, we can dissect the trees in small little branches. It'll take six, six hours to take down a huge tree. There's been a couple of times when I'm cut with, I was always the grabber and the thrower. That's all I did. I did, did the most of the cutting. Sometimes I did. But I just had rotator cuff surgery here. This one needs it. Because uh, there's a couple of times when I got branches that were just way too heavy for me. And I'm holding on to that branch. I got to take this way. I got to throw it off to the side. <coughs> um, so cut small. Take your time. Uh, it only took a couple of times over the course of 15 years. Where I ended up with a limb that's way too heavy for me because we didn't judge it, we didn't look at it close enough um, to make sure that we don't have a problem. So you can certainly injure your arms if you're not careful. It's happened to me a couple of times. Right. And you know, not everybody is uh, fortunate to have a lift or, you know, uh, some sort of a, a feature like that to get up. And, and I recognize that. Um, don't be afraid to call a professional, okay? Don't be afraid to call a professional. They know what they're doing, they're insured, and you can work on your business instead of in your business. Again, if you are not here, then what? So, yes? That's why the, you should really never cut on an extension later. <laughs> no. 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 no, 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 no. I had a branch one down and it hit the bottom of the ladder. You see that all the time. So if you can't reach it with like the pole saw, then you get like a, a lift. You can get a tow behind. Yeah. And it's not very expensive, but don't ever cut on a ladder. Yeah. You know, you you have those, like Dave said, you have those limbs that are hanging over uh, people's seasonal members, <coughs> and yeah, they're they're barking at you to get them down. Um, nine times out of ten, a dead limb, dead tree never falls. It's usually the live ones that really have an issue. 
But um, if you have to call a professional to do it, you just might be overwhelmed with, you know, am I doing the right thing or, or whatnot. Don't be afraid to call a professional to come in. And if, if anything, have them top off the trees. Take that top off and just leave the, the stick up there. You can always, if you want, get the stick down. But you've got that big canopy that's hanging over that seasonal camper or structure of yours, you know, go on. I do that all the time, even though I have a lift, even though I am a firefighter, I hate heights. The only reason I go on a roof of a house is because I know there's an ambulance waiting for me. <laughs> you know, so I'll just tell you, when it comes to taking down the canopies, I hire that out and just say, hey, you know, I want the canopies, leave the stick up there. I can always get the stick. The stick is not going to go anywhere. It could sit there for a year or two. Yeah, I think to your point too, Jim, uh, we have owned our campground 15 years and we only bought a lift two years ago. So we went for 13 years without a lift, basically just pull saws and probably unsafe tactics at yeah, that point. A lot of um, but uh, we hired a tree guy to come through every year and we did all the groundwork for him. So that's something you can do to help, help save yourself too. Obviously, probably most of you know that, but um, he would just go through and do all the high work and anything low we would take care of for him. And you can keep him moving along a whole lot faster that way. And like Jim said also, we only had him take it down to the point where we knew we could handle it and then he went on to the next one. So I think those are all uh, good things. Go ahead, Bert. Just one comment. thinking twice about doing any tree work, don't do it. Tree work is extremely dangerous. And, and like these guys are telling you, split second, you could be fatally injured. Whether you get cut, tree falls on you, branch falls on you, falls on somebody else. If there's any question about it, get a professional. Yep. Even if you knew better, it still happens. Yes, correct. So, even if, you know, even if you know perfectly what you're doing, it still happens. That's so. exactly correct. Yep. The other thing I was going to mention too, Jim, is uh, you touched on having people help you. I think especially with spring coming up, uh, you might have new employees, you might have somebody that's never done it before. Make sure you take time to go through with them uh, what they're doing if they're helping you move brush so they don't walk straight behind you when you, you can't see them and you're running a saw. And, or, that, that they're not underneath you because you know, when you're up there, a lot of times you're not always totally looking or you drop it and as soon as you're up 60 feet and you drop it, and he starts walking underneath, it's too late. One, one more comment to the working in a lift. If you have people working on the, one thing that I've trained the people working for me um, when I'm in the lift working mm -hmm. is if your eyes aren't looking up, you're not working with me doing tree work. You need to be focused on what's going on. So if you're in the drop zone, you need to be looking up, if you're even close to it. And, and I'll be honest too, something that I just learned about too, which is was very surprising that everybody knows that, you know, an employee that's uh, under 16 uh, realistically cannot operate any machinery without proper training, right? And I believe it's uh, 16 that they can't run uh, a vacuum cleaner. Am I correct, Scott? Basically. So realistically, we all have 16 year olds that can't even run a, a vacuum cleaner. So I would really highly suggest not using your young employees for any type of helping you around trees or any, anything dangerous for them. I would, I would suggest not. Unless they're your kids, then I learned you can do whatever you want. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as kids, then we prefer. Yeah. Then you can slaves. say, "Hey, catch." Yeah. Well, you have another son, right? Yes, that yeah. one right there. Yeah. <laughs> there is, if you want to, we can Google it, or the state has a child labor law, so to speak. They can tell you exactly what age brackets they can or cannot do with different types of equipment. And all we need to do is have OSHA come in once, and then it's going to have a big ripple effect. So, so on the topic of OSHA, uh, we pulled some information here to go over, but uh, this card that you can't read up on the PowerPoint can be found on the back of your slide deck here. So if you want to take the time to read through that later, it's good nighttime reading. 
Uh, so the next thing we're going to go through is we're just going to go through the different uh, pieces of tree care and safety, safety quickly. We covered a lot of it already, but uh, we talked about mostly the improper way to do things. So now this is the, the proper way. So uh, these are possible hazards uh, when you're doing tree care that you see up there. So does anybody see anything missing that was already mentioned in this, in this room? How about a camper? So uh, like Dave said, uh, I think probably one of the biggest hazards we have as we're working in our parks is uh, obviously people, the public, and campers and equipment, cars, whatever it may be that's laying around. So, uh, so in my campground, if you'll go back, in my campground, I probably wouldn't have that, I wouldn't have that, I wouldn't have that. I'd probably maybe have one guy standing there, and that's about it. That's my tree trim. Um, we, we should do this. We should do this. We should rope off an area if, because we have guests coming in. If we're during a storm, we should rope off an area. Get the caution tape, it's cheap. You should. At least you're doing something. Because all of a sudden something happens, a little Johnny comes in and gets hit by even your employee taking a branch and going like this. Where was your safety zone? So at least have <coughs> something. Something's better than nothing. Yep. I know in our park too, we always have seasonals that think they want to help. And they're so always curious and want to or, know. Or drink yes. beer and watch you. So uh -huh. And stand too close when they watch you. Yeah. Yep. Sitting in a golf cart. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, uh, in your drop zone. Yeah. Always make sure no matter who they are, if they're not supposed to be in that drop zone, keep them back. Doesn't matter. Especially if it hits concrete or blacktop, or they can bounce way further than you'd think sometimes. So, yep. Yep, exactly. So uh, this just covers the, the the areas we saw on that picture, but we're going to kind of go through each of them quickly here, even though we covered a lot of it already. So uh, public safety. This kind of goes back to the uh, keep that barrier, caution tape, cones, whatever it may be. If it's a road in your campground block a vehicle across it, a campground vehicle, whatever you can, it's just running on its own now. All right, there we go. So whatever you can do to keep people back and keep a safe area. Also, uh, when, you're, when you're setting up that zone, plan ahead, you know, figure out where your tree's gonna fall, uh, where stuff could bounce to the, to the point of that, so. And with that, uh, Ben was talking, Ben and I were talking just a little bit ago, <coughs> He has a drone that he actually has where he can go up and he can get the height of the tree and he's real tech savvy on that end, um, knowing how far that's going to fall. So he'll take his drone up and see how big it is and some people just go, well, it's 10, 20, 30, 40. I kind of do it old school, so I take a stick about like this big and I put it in front of my face <coughs> and I look at the tree and if that's the tree I'm looking at, I just keep on going back like this, until I don't see the top of the tree, and that's where it's gonna fall. That's where the end is gonna fall, provided you make the right cut. And making the right cut is crucial. <laughs> <laughs> How tall is your stick? <laughs> right? <laughs> the, the stick is only about 16 inches. It's gotta be straight. And so you take that, and you put that right there, and you just keep on walking back in a straight line, and when the top of the tree comes to the bottom, that's where it's gonna fall. Interesting. Yeah, and I think uh, to this point, any, any method you can use to figure out how tall that tree is is helpful because the, the example of the drone last year, we had one where we were really questioning if we wanted to handle it ourselves or if we wanted to have somebody come take the top out of it because there were a bunch of campers around. And I said, well, why don't I just fly the drone up? The drone has elevation, you can see how high the tree is. And it was within like five feet, we figured of where we thought it would land, so it was, Pretty helpful from that aspect so and then it was taller than the lift could yeah like you said it was over my head and i wasn't comfortable with it so we ended up saying nuts with this we took the whole tree instead and took it and we should, probably shouldn't have because it was that voice was in my head should we do the whole tree well it's got room so long we make the cut right 
No risk, no reward, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, yes, Dan. We don't drop trees. We take them down all the way to the end. Then we'll cut four to six foot pieces out of the tree. Very, very most. We just never drop a tree. Yeah, and I think. Uh, if you're if you're in a situation where you can do that, I know we've found that's a best practice as well because we do a whole lot of that now versus where when we didn't have a lift, when we didn't have a lift, every tree we dropped came down in one piece. But then you get into all kinds of different issues like you know debris flying, and when you take when you take a tree down with a lift, there's no flying debris other than what you drop. Everything that we drop, um, person can pick up and walk away with it. Yep. So we've all had storms go through our park. I've had uh, two major storms go through the park uh, in, in our park. One, uh, that one storm was um, in 1993, July 3rd, 1993. My parents had still owned the campground. A storm came through. They set up emergency management in our campground. Nobody got hurt. Our park took us two years to clean up our park to even get it where we could move around. There was trees from all over. We, yes, sir. We had a storm a couple years ago, uh, which I was fortunate to have some campground friends uh, come and help me. Uh, again, that's what we're, we're in. We all help each other. So thank you, Scott, for, for coming and doing that. I appreciate it. But I learned from my parents back in the day when it took us so many months to clean that up. I called the professionals and I called uh, a friend of mine that owns a logging business. So now what I do is call him when I have anything. He comes in, clips it, picks up the tree, walks it up to the street, drops it, and I'm done. It takes nothing to do that. Again, calling the right people to do the job. We want to work not on our, sorry, we don't want to work in, in it, so to speak, where we're doing what we shouldn't be doing, work on what matters. Uh, yes, tree trimming matters, but hire the professionals. So we actually do it a lot faster and a lot smarter, and they bring in the right equipment. Yep, and I think, as we found out, you definitely learn as you go. So oh, that's yes. one of the most important lessons. So uh, just to get through the rest of the OSHA stuff here, uh, this talks about the drop zones. This is also in your PowerPoint and on the OSHA guide. But uh, establish your drop zone. Uh, they recommend, obviously, nobody should be within one times the length of the tree because that's where it could fall and hit somebody. And uh, they recommend keeping everybody back two tree lengths for flying debris and all that kind of good stuff. So. Uh, we got that there. Then uh, chippers, you don't want to be like uh, the guy named Nine Toes there. So uh, with the chippers, obviously they're a huge safety risk. I think m almost more than chainsaws, that's probably where you hear uh, more stories more stories from. Does anybody in here use a chipper, just out of curiosity? Or I was, I was kind of curious. I know we don't in our campground, but I didn't know if that was something common in other campgrounds at all. Yep, so I think that's probably more common in campgrounds, I would guess, than a chipper, but um, if you do operate a chipper, it's very important uh, to be safe. Uh, don't wear loose clothes, don't let it hook you, don't let it pull you in, keep your arms, legs, these things and feet on your, yeah. on your hoodies. You know, even when you're cutting trees, these things on your hoodies can cause problems. Yep. Yep. Speaking of listening to saws, has anyone tried new electric ones yet for small jobs? I just bought one, I haven't had a chance to try it yet. So we all battery operated chainsaw, anybody got those yet? I got a small steel uh, and uh, it's nice for small work. Yeah, for small jobs. Yeah. Pruning or something like that, or you know, a bump, bump branch is typically what I want it to be. As long as it's a small diameter, you should manage. Yeah. And those yeah. small steels with the bucket handles are really nice when you're up in a lift and you're just yeah. limbing. You can go all day long versus having a regular chainsaw where it's just on your elbow the whole time. So yeah, it still doesn't make, make one. Yes, literally, 
ergonomically, ergonomically correct, where it's a lot easier to use for trimming yeah. than a regular chainsaw. Yeah. 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 Are you talking uh, gas or electric, just yes. to clarify? Oh. Both? Okay, yeah. Yeah, because uh, that's another topic too, you know, if you have the right equipment, if you're going to be up in a bucket, make sure you have a bucket saw. Um, it makes life 100 times easier and safer. Yep, the um, 193s, the 201s. But, yep, on the topic of electric chainsaws, I know uh, even within the last year, they have come along a lot further, probably two years back, they were a joke. And um, you know that, that electric, those, those electric equipment, I think we're going to see that in our industry relatively quick. I know you see uh, like landscaping crews and stuff starting to use electric trimmers in their business because the neighbors don't hear it, the customers don't hear it, and you know, yep, it's it's all it's all low low noise stuff. And you know, if you're out there trimming during the week and you've got campers around, that's going to be something to consider at some point when when it can stand up to what we need it to do. So the, the nice the nice thing with the electric saw, though I don't know about the RPMs on the electric saws don't have quite what you know your gas saw has. The best feature of that electric saw is that as soon as uh, his fingers off of that uh, yeah. uh, clutch yeah. or off of the gas or the electric, it, it stops. Yeah. It stops. So as soon as he's his fingers off of the trigger, it stops. That chain stops. It doesn't slow oh, down. Yeah. So yep. So the next slide is lifts. I know we already talked a lot about lift safety, but uh, we've got a nice, nice demonstration here of something Mike would try to do to get higher. So using the forklift to lift the lift. Yep, got to get that last branch. So, uh, but I think some good general practices uh, in reality are to inspect your lift before you use it. So you know before you take it 85 feet up in the air, maybe make sure it comes back down kind of thing. So just, just run it through the paces a little bit before you use it for a whole day. Also, if you have outriggers on your lift, put them down. Don't think I can get away without it. You know, I, I, can, I can reach that far over the side without the outriggers. Don't do it. If you have a newer lift, hopefully it'll stop you from doing it. Uh, although we all know that kind of technology breaks and then stops us from doing what we need to do as well. So also, if you're gonna be in a lift, you better have a harness, obviously. Hopefully that's fairly common sense. And uh, don't be tempted to use your lift for material handling or as a crane uh, if that's not what it's rated for. So I know there's been a couple instances where it'd be like, uh, it'd be really nice if we had a crane and that lift kind of looks like a crane. So uh, it gets tempting. don't do it. <laughs> yeah, there, there are some though that are rated for that kind of stuff. So I mean, if it is designed for it, Certainly something you could use it for, but I know specifically the one we have is not. So, so there's that. And then uh, the last thing is anytime you're up in the air or could even be using a pole saw, watch out for those power lines. Um, a lot of campgrounds have power lines coming in through the campground somewhere. And you know, especially when you're on a lift, it doesn't feel that high after you've just been up trimming a tree and you could drive right through one. So I know our campground, we have one right on our way back to the shed that you always got to watch for and make sure you're under. So, and with power lines, again, one of the one of the safety things is, by all means, if a storm comes by or something happens and a power line is down, don't assume that power line is is dead. Um, stay away from it. Call uh, emergency management; they'll come in and take care of it. Don't just think that you know, well, it's down. It, that already tripped the master breaker. Always respect that power, and you need to stay far enough away. From and also, that. the power company will come in, and they're happy to come in. If you got a tree that you're trimming next to it, they're happy to come in and kill the power. You know, they want you to call them. You know, that's that's what they want. They don't want to hear the fatality. They want you to call them so we can we can mm -hmm. all walk to the next day. And depending upon the situation, they may even be willing to take the tree for you Correct. down below. Yep the height of the power line. I'm sure it depends upon the company and so on and so forth, but we've had a few trees that we've gotten the power company to take down because mm -hmm. it's too close to the power line. It's not safe. Yep. And so they didn't want, they didn't, they, you know, it was, it was a line they chose not to, they said, well, we'd better just take it down. I'm like, <laughs> go ahead. Perfect. Yeah, especially if you think, again, we all think that, ah, you know, we're going to just take that, that song, just trim that so it doesn't interrupt that power if we have a windstorm. No, don't. Don't. Just don't. 
Yep. So I think that was the last slide on uh, tree safety, chainsaws, all that kind of good stuff. Um, does anybody have any questions left on that? I know we can talk about it. Just a quick comment about the storms. Um, yep. Every morning when we, after a storm, we go around and kind of pick up all the branches on the ground. Um, but be looking up as well, because there's been times when we don't catch branches that have gotten stuck in the trees. We get to a weekend where you know, a customer is supposed to be saying we have a branch above us, that can cause a huge problem. If a windstorm comes through and drops that on top of their trailer, or you know, if it's over the tent or anything like that. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's uh, if you if you know about it, get rid of it because there's already enough stuff you don't know about uh, that's gonna come after you. So, if if somebody brings a let's just say, and and they will, somebody brings to your attention that that limb looks like it's gonna fall on my camper, and it actually does throughout that weekend whether it's green or not, you're responsible for that. So if they bring it to your attention, you must take care of it. Because you knew about it, because somebody told you about it. So just for what it's worth, somebody tells you that there's a limb and it's gonna fall on their camper, and it actually does. You just open yourself up to a huge, huge, yeah. We don't want that. Yeah, I think the most important part is, especially if, if you see the issue with it, take some sort of action. Move the camper out of the site, block off the area, figure out how to get the tree down. I know uh, one, it was like a Friday night or something, we had a tree start to tip, just randomly tip over in the campground. It was a pine tree, the roots came loose. We actually, it was like 10.30 at night when we found it or something, I think. We ended up tying it off to another tree for the night, and first thing in the morning we took it down because... It was a hazard. Oh, it's just coming loose. Yeah, it's just I, I slowly know. starting to tip over. And right. so For if- For those of us that don't have lifts, you have to do the accommodation thing. Yep. Like, well, and that was before we had a yeah, lift. That was, so, yeah. And that was a Saturday morning with the full campground that we mm -hmm. took down a tree. So that was one of those situations where you got, you know, 100 people watching, you got to get everybody back. And that's a tree, we didn't have a lift, so we tipped it over. And, and everybody wants to tell you how to take it down, okay? Yeah. There's one guy that's in charge of that. It's the guy that's running the saw, because he's the one, you get all these guys telling you different things, and all of a sudden your mind starts spinning, and you get messy, you know? Do what you need to do. You need to know you're the professional. Yep, and Make listen, the right call. listen to your people. Yes. So, yep. uh, that's a good topic. So, let's go, we've got about, 20 minutes left and I think I've got about three slides here so this will be more hopefully discussion than anything else but uh, let's go on to some tools and maintenance so we just want to talk a little bit about the different types of maintenance that are in your campground and I think it's important to talk about the different types of maintenance because we're always so busy we just want to get it done but uh, to some extent you have to think about uh, what's important and uh, you know if you have if you have things broke obviously they need to be fixed but um, you know, are there things you can be doing along the line when you realize something's breaking, can you fix it then so that way you don't have such a major repair in the end? And I, I think we probably can all think of examples of this in our campgrounds. And uh, the most important thing is if it's something you need to make time for, make time for it. Don't ignore it because likely it'll only turn into a bigger problem. So. Uh, yeah, I just I thought we I thought it'd be helpful to break it down by you know kind of four categories. So there's obviously preventative maintenance you do in your campground. We can all think of examples of that. If you're driving a utility vehicle around, change the oil in your utility vehicle so that doesn't break down on you. That's a simple example. Then uh, you know repairs. You got a broken faucet. Well, obviously that's got to be fixed. But you know if you have a, if you have a, if if you happen to notice you have a slow urinal running, you know snake the thing out because guess what. When that weekend comes and you're busy, <laughs> you're gonna have another problem. You're gonna end up having a plumber come or you're gonna have to figure out how you're gonna have the manage the time to get it done. So so, so preventative maintenance is is of course, you know, number one up there. Preventative maintenance, though, you know, in our spring we are running at full capacity and we're just in deep and we don't have the time for it but you have to make a little time for preventative maintenance. Otherwise, you won't have whatever tool or equipment it is when you need it. So it doesn't matter if, yes, sir. On a preventive maintenance, otherwise, it's just a busy car. 
<clears throat> I can't argue that we're not. We're campground owners. We all have all winter long. We have all winter to do all this preventative maintenance. If you don't have your preventative maintenance done by spring, what were you doing all winter? Right. I mean, you make the list. And, and this year we're doing something we're different. We're going to start documenting everything for two reasons. One, to make sure that it gets done. Number two, for liability stuff. All your GFCIs, all your exit lights, all your parking brakes on your rental golf carts, anything going through the playground, all the fasteners, your swings, your hook. You know, once a month, go through have your guy check the swings, make sure the, the asphalt isn't going to break up there or anything. And that, I work in a factory, and we, did, we call them PMs, preventative maintenance. And the most important thing is if you do it, and then you document it, and have a file. <coughs> so God forbid something does happen, you know, hey, we, we check this stuff periodically, you know, that really holds up in court. I would think it would really be helpful if you have an actual program and things are documented with dates and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. I think another couple of things that help for us because we're in the middle of nowhere is make sure you have all the pieces and parts available and let you know what's going to break down. That's number one. Yeah. Extra everything. Yeah, and then number two is we put somebody in charge of that maintenance and then you as the owner have to give them time to be able to work on that because then you have one neck to squeeze in a nice way, right? For your maintenance vehicles or we got one guy that takes care of the pool, but he's got to have time to do that, but he makes sure everybody else is using that equipment right and you give them the time to do that, and you give them the back, and for those that aren't doing it correctly, to make sure they stay ahead of it. And our downtime for stuff, knock on wood, has gone down dramatically over the last couple of seasons by doing that. I bet your ranger's not gonna start when you go home. Right. <laughs> I <knocked> on wood. <laughs> then another thing is kind of making sure that everybody who is working with said equipment is up to scale with how they work and what you need, you know. Someone who is using a mower and I might not know that you have to grease up all desserts or blow out the air filter or anything like that, and then that gets skipped and then it's not done for the next time, and then you get potentially a bigger problem. Yep. If you have a lot of employees, I think uh, possibly documented processes would be a, a good topic. And another topic is uh, systems, obviously, which you kind of went for there. Um, but also, if you see something that needs to be fixed, we all see stuff that needs to be fixed every day. But it may not need to be fixed at that moment, but something we could address during the winter. Make sure you document that somewhere. Make sure you write it down because otherwise you're gonna sit there during the winter going, oh, what do I need to do? You know, you don't you, you forget it. All summer long, I make, you know, if I see something to do in the winter, it goes on the list. That's yep. company issue, right? Everybody should have a company the kids issue. Work for them, I gotta give them one of these because I absolutely tell them more than one thing, they won't remember. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Not even I, I know what does help, but a big thing I learned from him is taking pictures of yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I have our, our host people, people since we have smartphones nowadays. If they're cleaning the cabin and we got people checking in at two hours from now, they send me a picture of the, the light bulb that's out, oh, the, the loose toilet seat, whatever it is. They send you they send me a picture of it, you know. So I know exactly yeah. what it is. It's a grease boards. So a maintenance grease board right. so he knows what's going on. A daily like routine, you know, grease boards for the kids that can't remember more than five things. Can go, oh yeah, I haven't done that yet, I haven't done that yet, I haven't done that yet. And then the other one is a parts list. So when they take the last 20 amp breaker, they write it down. Need more 20 amp breakers or whatever, because you're not in it every day. Yeah, the last thing that you need is uh, a weekend to come, and all of a sudden you don't have a breaker or another GFI or, or something of, you know, where are you going to get it? Because Memorial Day, what happens every Memorial Day? It, yeah, you find out every pedestal yeah. and every whatever that's not working. It's inevitable. It's your first big pressure. Just going off of playgrounds, I will say this. Um, uh, you should annually go over your playground system at least once, if not twice a year. Check for those that have old-fashioned um, swing sets and things like that with chains and s hooks. Yeah. Inspect those. So that chain, if that chain is starting to wear and it's over halfway, replace it. Replace it. Um, and so look at every link. When you're, you pull that link up and look at it, because it's going to wear at the bottom. So look, look at it. Pull it up. And if those links are over a halfway, get rid of it. Get a new one. Same with the S-hooks. The S-hooks are going to wear uh, exponentially very fast. So uh, take care of those S-hooks. And another thing, sharp, sharp spots. So a sharp uh, bolt that's sticking out. Whether it's on your swing set or whether it's at your pool. Picnic whether, table. Picnic, well, pic, yeah, picnic table. So what I've learned is, I believe it's only a quarter inch that you can have sticking out with it being okay. Quarter inch is not much. So what I've learned to do is go to the electrical department and get that shrink tube and cut a little piece of shrink tube and heat that over that edge. It takes care of that. 
So you just take a little piece off of that shrink tube, put it on there, take your little torch. Now you have a safe uh, edge, so to speak. So, but it's crucial in that you document on your playgrounds that you do it because if somebody comes in uh, and, and wants records, you better be able to show it. And if there's an injury, you have to have documentation. Documentation's everything. Yeah, and force yourselves to do these things because while we're sitting here at Waco, it's always easy to say, yeah, I should really, I should really do that, I should really do that, but go home and force yourself to do it because when something happens, you're gonna be like, I learned about that at Waco and I should have did that. So, but uh, that's, that's, I think that's always the key because during the summer, you don't find time for that stuff and you need to find time. So, all right, so I think we uh, covered that one a little bit there. So, I uh, just wanna talk a little bit how to prioritize maintenance. So, uh, just, just some things to think about as you're uh, working on a, a project and something comes up. Um, how many people will it affect? So how fast, how fast do you need to address it? Uh, how long is it gonna take you to fix it? Uh, what does it cost? Is there liability involved? So like Jim said with the, the sharp objects, is there liability? And do you have the tool skills required or is it something you need to hire out? And so as, as you go through some of these things, I think you were looking in, what was that? What kind of magazine was that? A Woodall's? <sighs> What was it? I don't know, where, where did that come from? Because that's, that's where that, that came from. We were having the discussion, okay, what would you do? Would you fix the trip breaker or would you fix the pool first? You know, I guess there's circumstances too. You know, is there someone in the site? You know, or, you know, um, the guy just got there. It's gonna take me 15 minutes to fix the breaker, but the pool is, boy, it, it, a windstorm came through. It's gonna take a couple hours to get this fixed. Maybe I'll just <clears throat> quick throw the breaker in, although the pool is gonna affect more people. They understand the storm is coming through. The guy that pulled in the site's not gonna understand why he doesn't have power. You know, yep. And it's only gonna take a couple minutes to flip the breaker, and then you can move on to the next thing. And now but, you just got a bad review on your pool. Yeah, <laughs> right, yep. Or I got a bad review because I don't have power, so yeah. you know. <laughs> yep. So uh, it's, just, it's just good to kind of think of, uh, run through some of these scenarios in your head, you know. Did, if you have a dirty bathroom versus long grass out in your campground, which do you need to fix? Well, the long grass didn't just get long on its own you knew it was getting long. So that dirty bathroom though, all it takes is one person to come in and destroy it. So, and how many people walk in and out of that dirty bathroom that, that reflect on your campground? So as you go through scenarios, those are just some things you can think of uh, to, to cover, should I do this or do this? Because we all need to prioritize our days. There's so much going on and just gotta write those, write those things down that you gotta get back to and whether it's a faucet that's leaking on a site that nobody's in, maybe you can go back and fix it in an hour or two. It doesn't have to be fixed right away, so. So, and then uh, the last slide I have up here is uh, tools and equipment. So uh, we talked a little bit about that earlier. I think you had comments about using them properly and uh, also along the lines of taking nine trips to a shed, uh, keep them organized. I know this last year, uh, one thing we did in our campground, uh, it's mostly my dad, my brother, and I that do maintenance in our campground. And we kind of each have our own gator that we use. And this last year, we actually put a toolbox on each gator with a set of screwdrivers. It's got a set of pliers. It's got almost, we can almost fix anything out in the campground. Maybe not 100%, but at least when you go out to replace a, a water faucet and you go, geez, I got the wrong size wrench. Well. We have it in our toolbox now, so, and we, they're Saves not, lots of trips. they're not expensive tools. We just went and bought some cheap Harbor Freight tools or Menards tools or whatever we could find in case they got stolen or rusty or, or whatever, but that, that was a big, or uh, lost, a, you know, you left lost. them somewhere. Yep. How many people, you know, the other day, where's that drill driver? We're missing one. One son goes, I don't know. He don't know. Guess who did it? Yeah. Left it in the back of the gator. Forgot all about it. Yeah. Except for he didn't admit it then. Well, <laughs> it's on camera now, okay? <laughs> so, so we've got about uh, five minutes left. You know, the can I borrow of this uh, kind of brought up, you know, uh, a few questions in my head. Because, uh, show of hands, how many have seasonals in your park? Okay, so how many have uh, uh, a utility shed um, for maintenance? Do you find your seasonals going in it? Asking for tools and things? 
If they went in it, I'd kick them out. Right. There's some, <laughs> there's some campgrounds that have a shed just for uh, seasonal tools, like a roof, mm. a shovel. Gotcha. Uh, just the thing, few things. I've seen some campgrounds go to so that they're not going to your maintenance shed. Going, hey, so you're saying actually have like a designated spot eight, for stuff that seasonals like can borrow. A eight, a 10 by 10, uh, yeah, borrow and bring back so that they're not. So borrow. Or take. Or take. <laughs> or take. Yeah, or take. <laughs> In their case, take. So you're proposing an empty shed. Right, okay. right. I thought and you meant like, have, I thought you meant a maintenance shed, like your, your no, shop that the seasonals no, no, go no, in. No, no, Once they start coming into your shop and they think that it's okay, a word will spread. So sometimes it wouldn't be a bad idea to have a little shed that has, you know, a garden rake, a, shed, a shovel, things that they're going to ask for. I would never put anything. Um, you, don't, you don't put chainsaws in there? Chainsaws, <laughs> I wouldn't put any of that in there. But I would put, you know, your, your things that people are going to ask for all the time. Um, I know that it sounds kind of odd, but it will take that pressure off of them always coming to your shed. And, and I, yep. trust me, Bert has seen my shed, and he'll ask me for something. I'll go, well, it was there, but some seasonal must have came in and took it. Yeah, if, if you do go that route, too, that really stops the, well, do you have this I can borrow? Well, is it out in that shed? If not, then sorry. Yeah. So that's, that's a good, interesting approach to it, for sure. So does anybody have any questions? Yeah. With five minutes, you know, I mean, seriously, the class is for you. If you have any questions, um, make sure. You know, this is a pet peeve I have. When you or your employees use a tool, put it back where it came from. Because all of a sudden, I use a tool, and I go and use it, and I set it here for a little bit. All of a sudden, he comes in a shed, and he spends 15 minutes trying to find a tool that I didn't put back. Well, it's just a bad waste of time, you know? Even if try, it's where it was supposed to be. Yeah, try to get in the habit of putting things back. You know, I know it's tough because we're all busy, we're all in a hurry, and sometimes you'll say, I'll just set it here for now. Now, where is it later? You don't know. Now you gotta either go get one or try to figure it out. But to me, that's the biggest thing is, is be organized. You know, make sure you know where your stuff is so when you need it, you can just grab it and go. Yes, sir. And then even if it's like a drill or something that you might, you know, we sometimes we're using shovels for transferring or whatever, and we're using it the next day, we just leave it right in the mule so we can jump in and get started the next day. You know, if it's a drill and you think, oh, we're just going to do it tomorrow in the morning, someone might need that later tonight, so I just put it back and grab it in the morning. That's where a shovel isn't as, you know, important. Right. So it might need a drill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. so, a couple of them in there, yeah. so, with, so with that being said, uh, again, I hope that you've taken a lot out of the class today. I know it's the first day. Uh, if you fill out your um, uh, course evaluations, we'd appreciate it. Second, again, as I said, stated in the beginning, if you take nothing out of this class, take care of yourself. You're number one. So if we don't have you, how are things going to run at your campground? So take care of yourself, and, and we wish you the best during the convention, and have a great weekend.